So if you can have your Bibles open at the passage we've just read, John's Gospel and chapter 1. Now in the opening verses, those first 18 verses uh, of John, uh, we, that's the prologue, the introduction, John introduces us to the greatness of the eternal word. The word is God and he becomes flesh. He is our physical creator and by coming into the world he comes to be our spiritual recreator. He is God. He is the creator of all things nothing accepted and he is the source of life and light and grace and truth he is god and he became flesh a real and a true man what causes men and women boys and girls to believe and to receive the status of children of god it is seeing, it is beholding the Saviour, it is seeing and beholding the glory of God through the manhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who see and believe in that way, for them the glory shines through him. It is unmistakable, it is the glory of the unique Son of God. John takes us through all of those things in his prologue, those first 18 verses. And here he is telling us then that the, the word who is God has come in the flesh in order to make the Father known. And then in the remainder of the chapter, uh, he tells us three things about those who believe. We must witness to him. We must prepare for him. We must follow him. The great witness here, the first point I want to bring to your minds, the, the first witness here uh, is, is John, verse 19 and following. John the Baptist, or as I do prefer to call him, John the witness. The Lord Jesus comes into the world to be the light of the world. And John's wit purpose is to witness to that light. And so here is John the witness. And first of all we see that as the witness, John does not want to speak of or put himself first. The Jews come and they ask him, who are you? I am not the Christ. They persist, who then are you? I am not Elijah. The scripture uh, foretells us that Elijah would, be cut, would come before the Messiah, that he would pre come and, and appear before the Messiah and usher in the Messiah into the world. The Lord tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that John the Baptist is actually Elijah. So why does John deny it here? Why does he answer so? It's quite simply because, because, John, um, uh, because John cannot see himself as Elijah. We think of John the Baptist, John the Witness, as a great person, and that is right. Uh, we see him as the greatest of all the prophets. He's the greatest of all the prophets because all the prophets up until John said, the Messiah is coming. It was only only John as a prophet who was able to say he is here behold him that's what makes him the greatest but when he sees the Lord Jesus Christ and he sees how great and wonderful he is when he sees how glorious how high and how exalted is the Savior John looks at himself and he sees himself as nothing at all. He can't even think of himself as great. He can't think of himself as an Elijah figure. 
In these opening verses of John, our Saviour is pointed out to us, isn't he, as the eternal word, full and overflowing with grace and with truth. Um, you, you, sometimes we've seen these great water mains, haven't we? And, uh, and uh, the, the, there's a break and the water is flowing out and gushing out. And at some point it's got to be capped off. Uh, if it's not, it will just, it seems it will go on forever. Well, it, 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 it will dry up eventually. But here is grace and truth and it's gushing forth from the Saviour and it is in, in, in infinite quantities and infinite quality and it can't be capped off. Its flow cannot cease. He is full of grace and of truth. And, and John sees all of that. And he says, verse 23, I am a voice, a disembodied voice, a witness. Simply that, nothing more. And we can all be like John. We can all be a voice in one way or another. We can all be a signpost, as it were, pointing to the Saviour, because that's what we are called to do, to point to the Saviour. And here um, uh, we have to remind ourselves, of course, that we, we must point in the right direction. We don't point to ourselves, but we point to him. We see that John really doesn't like talking about himself, does he? Did you notice as we read this together, John is increasingly brief. Uh, he's, he's very curt in his answers. By contrast, when we move on, the man who is healed of his blindness, is it chapter 9, um, the more he's questioned, the, the, the more voluble he comes, the more, the more he knows and understands, the more he's got to say. Well, here for John, it's different. When he's, as John is, is being questioned, uh, he's come to bear witness to another. Verse 23. And as he witnesses then, uh, John secondly speaks uh, of the greatness of the Lord. He says, by contrast to, to the Lord's greatness, he says, I am unworthy to untie his sandals. Now the untying of the sandal was the slave's job. It would not be expected of a, of a friend or a, a disciple, some lesser person in the group. It was the job of the slave. Now, have you understood the impact of what John is saying here? The disciples did many services for their masters, but there were some jobs that were just so menial that, that they, were, they went right the way down the line to the slaves. No disciple would dream of untying the master's sandals. It was the slave's job. And what is John saying? He's saying, I'm not even fit. I, I'm not even at the status of a slave in comparison to the greatness and the glory, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not even a slave in his sight compared to him. I am lower than a slave. And so he speaks of the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how great our Lord is. And that is true of our Christian witness. Our witness is to point to the greatness and the glory and the wonder of our Saviour. It is to exalt him so that we disappear somewhere into the background. You know, the technology that we have these days when you, you, you print a label of, of whatever sort and you, you, you can put a box upon the background picture and the whole thing is faded out in order to bring the type forward. It's like that, isn't it? We, we are to fade away in order that the Saviour may have the foreground and, and all the, 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 uh, and occupy all the interest of those we're speaking to. So, when people know that you are a Christian, when they hear you speak, what impression do you leave with them? When we speak of our Saviour and they hear us speaking and they know our other speaking and our living, 
Are they made to think more highly of the Lord Jesus Christ? As we speak of him, are they given a new respect for him? Or at least, do they think that you have the very highest respect for him and that you hold him in the very highest of regard? And we long, don't we, that as we witness to Christ and as we point out his wonderful and beautiful, clean, wholesome qualities, we long that others hearing us will be made ashamed of their own living ashamed that they have taken his name upon their lips and used it as a swear word and a blasphemous word we pray don't we we long that as we witness that ultimately people will be made to see his glory his glory and so as we go out and as we speak and as we share as we run our Christianity Explored courses and all the rest, as we speak in the Sunday schools and as we speak the Thursday club and so on, we long that, that those who hear us from the very tinies right the way through will, will know and understand something of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So John, as a witness, speaks of the greatness of of the Lord Jesus Christ but then he also as a witness speaks of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ verse 29 behold look the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world cometh the hour cometh the man only a great man can do a great work only the eternal word made flesh can take away the sin of the world no one else no one else could do this in all of our world's history there is no one like the the savior in his greatness or in his work such a work taking away our sin yours and mine taking away all the sins of all of his people requires that the person who is doing that work should be the unique eternal son of god behold he speaks of the work of god of the lord jesus christ behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world now we must understand and i'm sure most of you understand this already but we must recognize that john is saying something new he's saying something that is electrifying here He's saying that this man, who is the eternal word, who is God from all eternity, who has now become flesh, has done so in order to take away the sins of the world. Now you need to do a little bit of backtracking, as it were, in your imaginations. You need to be, uh, become a, a, a Jew in the, the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you were a Jew in those days, you knew your sacrificial system. You knew that sin demanded the death of the sinner. As simple as that. And you knew that the approved way of dealing with sin was the use of a substitute. And so we have the sacrificial system brought into the old system the old testament system and so a lamb is chosen and is brought forward and that lamb becomes the substitute and so the sinner places his hands presses upon this the, the head of the lamb and transfers symbolically yes but transfers his sin upon the lamb and so the lamb becomes guilty of the sins of the offerer and it is the lamb who is taken away and will die. But here is John knowing that system and he says, look, here is a man whom God has appointed to be the lamb who takes away your sin. This is electrifying. This is mind blowing for these people. 
to take away the sin of the world. It's the first ever usage in the New Testament. It tells us about the all-embracing, the comprehensive nature of the atonement. It tells us what our Saviour will do upon the cross will be adequate for all the needs of all his people. And this is right at the very beginning of the gospel. John is already, chapter 1, is already pointing away and towards the cross. It's reminding us, isn't it, chapter 1, verse 12, that to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. And so the witness speaks of the work, but then forth the witness speaks of the fullness that the Lord gives. Verse 33, let's, let me read that to you. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. He will baptise with the Holy Spirit here is an abundance. Here is a completeness. He will baptise with the Holy Spirit. Let's think of our church baptism, water baptism. Here is the person who has been brought forward for baptism. And that person, as he or she is baptised, is immersed. They are showing the totality of their death to the old way of life. It's going into a watery grave. I am dying to my old way of life. And as you rise out from the water, it is a reminder and it is speaking of the thoroughness, the totality of the cleansing which the Lord gives. We rise to a new clean life. And here is John the witness. And he's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to us infinite spiritual resources through the Spirit. He will baptise us not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. He will immerse us in the Spirit. He will fill us with the Spirit. Which is why Paul is able to say, Ephesians chapter 1, that all believers have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Every believer, every blessing. Why? Because they've been baptised by Christ in the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 2, 9 and 10. Since the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Christ, then we who are in Christ have come to fullness of life in him. Have you come to Christ? Yes, then you've come to fullness of life in Christ because he is the one who baptises you with the Holy Spirit. You are immersed in the fullness and the richness of the baptism which Jesus gives. And so John points to the Saviour. He points to the Saviour as the Lamb of God who takes away sin and as the Lamb of God who baptises with the Spirit. And here is then he brings us into the richest of spiritual blessings. Sins forgiven and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so here John has been telling us, hasn't he? John the writer, John the writer has been telling us that in him, in the Saviour, is life and light and grace. And there is love and joy and peace. And, and in him there is patience and kindness faithfulness and gentleness self-control it is all there for us through the saviour the lord jesus christ nowhere else exclusively in him and so uh, we have john uh, coming to us verse 19 and following and he tells us that we are to witness to him but then secondly we are to prepare for him we are to prepare for him. And John does this uh, by baptism. He prepares, prepares others to receive the Lord Jesus Christ by baptism. Now, just as John was saying, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and that is a shocking and a new revelation, so the very idea 
of using baptism as a way of preparation for the Lord is also shocking. Now, baptism wasn't a new thing. What was new was the way in which John was using it. John was calling Jews to be baptised. Now, baptism was regularly used for those non-Jews who became Jews. They proselytised uh, and they began uh, to embrace the worship of the Lord God and they would begin to submit themselves to all the Old Testament law. So the, here's a Gentile, he, he or she hears uh, 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 about the Lord God and, and, and is drawn and attracted and decides, yes, I want to become a Jew, I want to become part of this nation, I want to become a God worshipper. And that person, if they're a man, would be circumcised. But then all Gentiles, whether male or female, would all be baptised. That was the system and it was a symbol of removing the contamination and removing all the dirt and all the pollution of the Gentile world. You were leaving the Gentile world behind. You were coming in to the true and real worship of, of Jehovah God and so you were baptised to wash away all that contamination, all the muck and filth of a Gentile world so that you could enter clean and pure into this new life. see what John is saying John is saying to receive the Lamb of God to prepare your hearts to to receive him everyone whether Jew or Gentile had to reckon with their own pollution all Jews were prepared to say yes Gentiles are defiled and they're unclean they need the cleansing of baptism John was saying yes they do and you do as well. You do as well. And that's why he's baptising. And so John, the witness, is putting all men, Jew and Gentile, all women, Jew and Gentile, every boy and girl, Jew and Gentile, into the same class. And it is utterly shocking. And so here is our Saviour. And he goes to the cross. And we say, don't we, that the ground is level at the cross. We all come to our Saviour in the same way, on level ground. There's no one comes in at a, at a slightly higher level than anyone else. The, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. How does a king come to salvation? He comes to salvation in exactly the same way as all his subjects. I've got to speak about Jonah. Isn't that fascinating when, when the king hears the proclamation of Jonah? He says that everyone is to wear sackcloth and cover themselves in ashes from the king right the way down to the slave. And so if you were looking over one of these little drones with a camera, I used to say helicopter, I've moved up to date, you see, one of these little drones with a camera. If you were looking down upon that nation, where's the king? Which one's the slave? Can't tell the difference. They all look the same. And this is how it is when we come to the cross. The ground is level. Every one of us, we come on level ground when we come to the, to the cross. How is a child saved? In exactly the same way as an adult. Repentance and faith. By trusting. That's our word to the children, isn't it? By trusting in what Jesus has done upon the cross. Repentance will not begin until the king and his subject, until the adult and the child says, I am unclean. And we need to see it. We need to reckon with our uncleanness. We need to know it and to feel it. Here are the crowds. And they follow the Lord Jesus Christ and he's taken them off into the wilderness and he's fed them miraculously with that food, multiplying the bread and the fish. 
And they said, wow, wonderful, here's a meal ticket, let's follow him. And here's another story. And here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells uh, Peter to, to cast his net out. And they enclose a great catch of fish. So that the boat is literally sinking. They're up to the knees in fish. And Peter says, go away. Stay away from me, Lord. I will contaminate you. What a difference. Both sets of people. Peter and the disciples and all of those people out in the wilderness, they saw the miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ performed. What's the difference? The difference is simply this, that one group of people saw what the Lord Jesus Christ did and they realised and saw their sin. That's the difference. Dear friend, have you been made to see your sin? Thank God for that. Isn't that wonderful? He's exposed to you, to your mind, to your consciousness, to your heart, your own sinfulness, so that you may go to the Saviour and receive from him the blessing of cleansing and the outpouring of his Spirit. And so here is John, the witness. And he says you have to recognise your own personal uncleanness. So he prepares the way. He is a witness. He is preparing the way. And he does so first by baptism. But then secondly he does it by telling and calling people to make a, a, a straight path for the Lord. Verse 23. He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now we are unfamiliar with really what John is saying here. We don't do these sort of things today, but um, I suppose in a sense it's a bit like saying we, we put out the red carpet. You know, the so-called famous and rich and the, all the rest. They, 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 they walk in, whatever it is they're going, on a red carpet. Well, in these days, in the Lord's days and, and before, uh, they didn't have tarmac uh, and, and uh, such like. Uh, and the roads were often bumpy and, and, and uneven. And if a great king or a dignitary was coming to your neck of the woods, to your, to your town, your, 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 uh, coming through the gates of your city, then you would send folk out and they would try and level out the ground. They would remove all the lumps and bumps and fill in all the hollows so that at least the last few yards the great dignitary could walk in on, on level ground. Prepare the way. And John is speaking here of our hearts. He's saying prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying get rid of all those obstacles which will stop him coming to you. For some it will be a habit that needs to be dealt with. For others perhaps it's a relationship. Maybe for some it's a reputation. We come across that a lot today don't we? I'm so good, I do not need your gospel. Yeah, right. But then we meet the other end of the scale. I'm so notoriously bad, I'm proud of it. I don't, I'm not interested in your gospel. I'm, look, at, look at how sinful I am. I, I'm beyond it. Or maybe it is just simply the busyness of life. Lives are hectic, lives are crowded. And we need to be saying to people, this is important, you need to prepare. You need to prepare the way for the Saviour to come. You need to stop and to give yourself a chance in order to reckon with these things. To reckon with the Saviour who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You need to give yourself so you can stop and think and ponder that you consider is the Lord Jesus Christ who we claim him to be? Are these things true of him? Or am I as bad as John is telling me? And all of those things we need to, to give ourselves a chance for. And so we say to people, prepare the way. Prepare the way. Make straight the way of the Lord. 
The wilderness of your life is full of stones and blockages and ob obstructions. And if you would know his fullness, then you must give yourself a proper chance to receive him. And so I'll ask you tonight, have you done that? Have you gone to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you stood before him? Have you knelt before him? Perhaps have you lain on your face in the dust before him and confronted yourself with your own personal uncleanness? And have you been prepared in the sight of God and in all that the Lord Jesus Christ is offering to you? Have you been prepared to get rid of all those obstacles that bar the way for the Saviour to come to you and give you and grant you his salvation? We need to stop. We need to think. We need to pray. We need to act. So far then, uh, we've thought of our preparation for him, sorry, our witness to him, our preparation uh, for, of, of heart and life for him. And then thirdly and simply, it is to follow him, to follow him. John the witness points to the Lord Jesus Christ and men are drawn to him. Andrew, first of all, and probably John, follow him. They've got many questions and they need to stay. And overnight they stay with the Lord Jesus Christ and they believe and they never ever, uh, sorry, they stay with him and they never ever leave him. It's, it's lovely, isn't it? Lord, uh, where, where are you going? Where are you going? And the Saviour simply says, come and see. Come and see. And that, that's gentle, tender, simple, isn't it? And we can just say to folk, the Saviour's calling. Come. He will take you and lead you. Go, go and see. Just go with him. Follow him. See where he takes you. See where he takes you. It's so gentle, so tender. And then the remainder uh, of the week, verses, uh, really verse 42 and following, uh, is taken up with, with men who meet with the Lord Jesus Christ and who believe on him. Their experience uh, is that once they're exposed to the Lord, he convinces them of who he is. And they realise that the witness of John the Baptist, John the witness, is right. And so in turn, we are introduced to Andrew and to John and to Peter and to Philip and to Nathaniel. That's possibly Bartholomew. Um, verse 41, we have Andrew who says, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. In verse 45, we have Philip saying, we have found the promised one, the one that was promised by Moses. This surely is the Messiah. And then the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to Nathaniel, and Nathaniel is suddenly switched on. It all suddenly is so clear to him. Oh, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Exposure to the Lord Jesus Christ rapidly changes minds and emotions and lives and so our witness is just so simple isn't it all we want to do all we have to do is to expose people to the Lord Jesus Christ and once men and women boys and girls are exposed to him then their minds and their emotions and their lives will be changed and so we have the witness of John, we have the witness of Andrew and of Philip and of Nathaniel. But as we begin to close, we find that the clearest witness is from the pen of John himself, John the writer himself. And John gives to us spectacular list of titles regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Word. He is God himself. In him is life, and that life is the light of men. Our Saviour is that true light that was coming into the world. He is the only begotten of the Father. Verses 34, 49, he is the Son of God. Verse 38, he is the teacher, our rabbi. 
He is our Messiah or the promised one by Moses and he is the King of Israel. All of those titles are given to the Lord Jesus Christ in these opening verses of John's Gospel. Is he truly all of those things? Is he truly all of those things to you? If so, then you may receive him and you may become a witness to him of all these things and you can follow him and you can follow him and know and have every confidence that you can follow him both now and onwards and into eternity. Because if he is as great as we have come to believe and understand, then how could such a wonderful and glorious saviour and king ever fail us? And so, our friends tonight, we are those who are able to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is he going? Where will he take you? Follow him and you will see. Amen.